So uh, let's give him a round of applause and get this thing back on track. <laughs> That's right, we're gonna get everything back on track. Uh, no, quite the opposite. I'm going to be talking mostly about how we've taken things way, way off track uh, in the past. And um, <clears throat> basically, yeah, this is, this is just, here's a bunch of mistakes and dumb things we did. Um, that's, that's really my only claim to fame. Um, I'm, I'm not being humble. Uh, like, the, the reputation I have made has been a guy that reacts well to his own mistakes. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty good at it. <clears throat> um, Let's talk about me for a little bit, just to get some context around this. Um, so I work at a company called Braintree Payments now. Uh, we do online credit card processing. Um, it's a big Rails app, is most of what we do. A uh, Rails app called The Gateway. I'll talk about it a little bit more here in a bit. Um, but it's been around since 2008, um, and it's kind of big. Uh, before that, I spent several years at Groupon. Uh, similar story there. Big Rails application. Uh, grew really quickly. Big team. Um, so it also uh, ballooned to a, a big size, um, and that introduced some, some challenges and some pain points. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, Dark Ages, not going to talk about it, blah, 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 blah. Um, fun fact about me. I have never been paid to write Rails new. Um, I only <laughs> seem to come into pre-existing applications that already have some age on them and increase bloat and age. Um, so I believe in not wasting time, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you all the big insights, ahas, up front, and then if you want to leave, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, don't write hacks. No matter what the temptation is, try not to do it. Um, beware of building frameworks, whether you're creating one from scratch, whether you're extracting it from your code. Um, there's a lot of hidden complexity that sneaks up on you and kills you. Um, <laughs> deliberately cultivate patterns in your application. Uh, this stuff is really, really important. Um, and you actually, like, it's good to do that pretty early on. Um, and then do what I call commit-based documentation. We'll talk about that here in a bit. So uh, let's sort of recap what I'm talking about. First, I want to be super clear. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about are actual things we've done in production. I'm going to be showing actual code um, or representations thereof when I need to protect privacy. Um, but I want to be super clear that everybody involved, myself very much included, because I'm talking about my own mistakes as well, um, had really good intentions. Um, <clears throat> everyone is trying to do better than we have no design in this application at all. Um, and it's, it's easy to go astray from that. Uh, I also want to be super clear, the things I'm going to talk about are totally blameless. Uh, some of the people who have done these things um, include myself, um, but they also include some of the best software developers I've ever worked with, people that I would work with again in a heartbeat. So I want to be super clear as I'm talking about these things, as I'm making fun of some of these things, um, that I'm, I'm not doing it from anything out of, of trying to help other people not repeat the mistakes I've made or that I've watched others make. So um, let's, enough prefaces. Uh, let's, let's start actually talking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is a picture of a monolith. Um, when I say monolith, it's very easy to think of like that sleek obsidian thing from 2001 that nobody would quite understand what it's about. Um, but that's not actually right. This is a monolith out in the real world. It refers to things that are carved from a single piece of stone. Um, and so when we talk about big, gigantic Rails applications, that's, that's what I want you to keep in mind, because uh, that's how I think about it. What the, the key differences are um, the, whoever the original artist or creator or engineer of this was, like the, this, they had an idea in their mind, but this also represents a series of compromises of the reality. Um, the shape of the stone, the, the time constraints, the, the constraints where they, whatever they were, um, like design is compromise in the real world. Um, the other thing that's, that's important to note is like this is super old. Um, and so a lot of things get lost in that transition. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about is time travel. <coughs> um, to put it in some concrete numbers. Um, so this is roughly lines of code in the, the primary uh, Braintree code base uh, that I'm going to talk about today year over year. Um, we started in 2008 with around 20,000 lines of code. We're uh, north of 300,000. Um, and in 2013, we thought, like, wow, this is a lot of stuff. We really got to gotta start decomposing this, uh, break it down. We got to do better next year. Uh, spoiler alert, we didn't. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it turns out decomposing a giant application is, is hard and it's challenging. Um, and this is a work in progress. Um, once, once I have some good advice or at least a, a pattern of mistakes we made in this, I'll give another talk sometime. Um, so of that current code base, uh, about 3%. Um, of the lines of code are from 2009 or earlier. Um, so my initial gut reaction to seeing that is like, awesome, great. That means most of the code is new code. I don't have to worry about it because we're replacing old code at a pretty good rate. It's not really that true. Um, 
if you think about the total amount of code we wrote in 2009, one third of it is still running in production. Um, that's actually much higher than I was expecting. Um, this came as a, as a surprise. So uh, it means the code we write um, for applications that are successful that don't go away, it's going to stick around. It's going to haunt us. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in our current code base, about 43% of the code, lines of code, are older than a year. Um, a year is an interesting metric, one, because it's a nice number, um, but two, um, it also, it represents like the termination of the half-life of a line of code. Um, and, and here, what I mean by that is, um, anybody who worked on that definitely has forgotten any reason why they wrote that code. So it's, it, now you, the only way you can find out more about it is from the code itself, with an asterisk that we'll talk about later. Um, so finally, I'm, I'm on the verge of actually making a point here, but I just want to have uh, one other definition up front. Um, so I'm talking about maintainability. Um, this is a really vague, hand-wavy term. I'm not going to be able to improve on that situation. Um, again, that's probably a separate talk. Um, but really what I mean throughout the course of this discussion is I mean minimizing the cost of making changes in the future. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not like... I'm not talking about error resiliency, I'm not talking about any of those things, I'm just talking about making it easy for me six months from now or 12 months from now to come in and make changes to, uh, and, and revisit the decisions we made. Um, there are, have been some attempts to formalize this. Um, this is a gnarly formula. Uh, this is uh, the Halstead volume uh, times 5.2 natural log of that times psychomatic complexity, lines of code, blah, 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 blah. Um, this doesn't actually work that well. Because um, really, like, I don't think lines, like, Com number of comments in a code base I don't think significantly impacts the maintainability one way or the other. Um, this has also been debunked a little bit. So the TLDR of that is, uh, this is, this is hard to measure and I'm, apologies for being vague and imprecise. All right, piece of advice one, don't write hacks. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna talk about a, a core Ruby function, definitely a real thing that exists that everybody uses all the time. I'm gonna talk about the method key grep on hash. Um, now, key grep, uh, you, might be, you might be asking if you say you're not super familiar with this function. Uh, I don't know how you could be. Um, what it does is it takes a hash, A to 5, Apple to 6, B to 7, takes a regex. Um, obviously, you can pass in a block, which is what I'm doing here. Um, I'm not really going to go into what that block does, but of course, this returns an Apple, the matching keys. Um, if you're not familiar, super familiar with it, I'll get, forgive you, probably more familiar with the, the base form without the block uh, that just takes a regular expression and, of course, returns a two-dimensional array of matching results. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I've, I've been misleading you a little bit. Of course, like, hash key grep is a bizarre function. It does not exist in Ruby. This, this is something we wrote. Um, this is something that was in the Braintree code base for a long time. Um, I, this, is, this is hard to explain, but you basically you pass in a pattern. Uh, you can optionally get back uh, the key, the value, and the regex match. Oh, dear, I, I touched the cable. Don't, don't touch the cable, Scott. I'm so sorry, Matt. I've, I've broken everything. See, I told you I was good at creating problems, right? Truth in advertising. We're going to need a young priest and an old priest. Hey, okay, all right. I will not touch anything with the exception of the right arrow key again. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna dive into exactly how this works. Again, that's probably a conversation for another time. But the key question here is why? Why did we do this? Because? I, I really have no good explanation as to why this, this was a method we felt was so important, we built it into hash. Um, this, like, there's, there's nothing here that couldn't have been, like this could have been key grep as a module that like said like from hash or something like that, but we didn't do that. We baked it into hash um, because. Um, so why is that a problem? Well, it doesn't really solve a problem for us. Um, certainly not a problem that's likely to come up time and time again. Um, and when we bake things into core modules like that, when we put things in, when we monkey patch uh, something, it becomes widely available. Um, it, it has high fan out combined with a high likelihood for change. Um, this is sort of the genesis of a maintenance nightmare. Um, what I mean by this, so um, let's, let's take this class A. It doesn't really matter what it is, class, module, whatever. It provides some contract to the world. When I talk about fan out, I'm talking about the number of things that use A. Um, so when we monkey patch something like hash, um, hash is everywhere. Um, it's very easy to use that where in, in the course of our applications. Um, but by monkey patching hash, we're also writing code that is almost certainly going to change. Um, the, the probability that this survives, um, you know, from 2009 to today is pretty low. 
Um, and in fact, it, it didn't. Um, we, we cut this out at one point, but it was there longer than I would like to, to admit. Um, <clears throat> so this, this creates a really challenging refactoring and a really challenging problem for us to solve. Um, we shouldn't make challenging problems. We have enough challenging problems as it is without creating new ones. Um, so, okay, you're probably saying like, Scott, okay, that's just a ridiculous contrived example. Like, surely there are better things to talk about. Um, okay, we'll talk about something a little bit more concrete. Um, so this actually is real Ruby code. This, I, I'm no longer going to mislead and lie to you, I don't think. Um, so here we have an array we're calling map to string on it. Great. Um, so this came out in Ruby 187, um, and at, at Groupon, um, we like this. This is, this is open source, so I am showing it. Normally I would not show code from other uh, employers, but you can actually find this out on GitHub if you really look for it. Um, so <clears throat> we, we like it, but oh, you know, for some methods, it'd really be nice to pass in an argument um, and not just say I'm gonna call toString, but I'm gonna call toString with something else. So here's a concrete example. Map plus, and then we can call, pass in an argument one this nice new square bracket, bracket uh, convention we came up. So it returns two, three, four. Okay, well, like, this, this is already a more sane example, and I can see why this is useful. Like, this is a problem I run into in, in Ruby. Um, but this wasn't enough for us. No, we needed more power. Um, because not every method has every function defined. In a perfect world it would, or not every object has every method defined. In a perfect world it would. When I, when I build a programming language, everything will be defined on every object. It'll be great, I promise. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, we have a, an array of mixed types here. We've got five and we've got Steve. Um, we want to call days ago on the things that know how to respond to days and ago. So we introduce this, uh, this minus sign, uh, which is our convention for, eh, if you can, do it. Um, and then anything we, we add on to this, because of course symbol plus symbol equals proc, um, anything you can add on to that, treat it under the same rules and conventions. So of course if we call five Steve map days ago, you get a date and nil. Um, again, this is actually kind of useful in certain, certain circumstances, but it's not a great idea. Why did we do this? It saves me time right now. Okay, this is already a way better argument than the last one. It was just sort of like, that's eh, cool, I guess. Um, it saves me time right now. Um, and, and so this isn't, this isn't a bad argument against writing software, but it is a, it is a bad reason to, to follow this hackish approach. Let's talk about why. Why is this problematic? So Ruby 186, this is the definition of symbol. Uh, this is a super blurry definition of symbol. Sorry about that, oh well. You don't really need to read it. Um, but it didn't define symbol to proc. We didn't do this stuff. 187 comes along, it defines symbol to proc. We do our extension here. We've got one, two, three map uh, with our square brackets. It's cool. Time passes, we're doing that a lot now. Uh, we do this so much uh, in, in, uh, in, at Groupon. Um, and again, like, you know, hey, it's, it's great. It's saving us time. Nothing's ever gonna change. This is never gonna be a decision we regret. Ruby 191 comes along. Um, there, there's a few new methods on symbol. We're continuing to add more and more invocations to this everywhere. Um, but there's new methods. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> they defined open brackets on a symbol. Why would they do this? Uh, well, I mean, the, the root cause is like, I've never actually used that in, in production. I've never used the intended version. I've used this all the time. Um, I <laughs> The, the intended version of this is like, well, you can kind of teach it as a string, uh, you can treat the symbol as a string, and you can get out portions of a symbol as another symbol. Like, okay, well, I, somebody in Ruby thought that was important to add. But now uh, we're boned because we rely on this totally different uh, definition of what this, this method accomplishes. Um, so this was an upgrade nightmare. Um, like, we got to a place, uh, 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 Hampton was talking yesterday morning about, like, you know, we've all been really great about updating and doing timely updates and all this stuff. And there's part of me thinking, like, well, the, you, didn't, you didn't run into this problem. Uh, because, like, this came out, we all just sort of had a chuckle, and we're like, yeah, I don't want to be the person that has to upgrade this code base now. This is going to be bad. <clears throat> um, so I'm not going to go quite this level of detail, but I'm going to go through some other insufficient reasons. Uh, this is one I did. This is a travesty I perpetrated. Um, I disagree with Ruby on principle. I don't like how Ruby works. I'm gonna do my best to change it from inside Ruby. Um, so, here's an okay version. This is not the problematic code. Um, I, I'll, I'll talk about this example a little bit later on. This is actually kind of V2 of a, pro a different problem I created. Um, I created some more problems in solving it. But, 
Um, so import or import from some si file CSV. It's really like we had a, a problem of recurring data imports um, from unknown or untrusted so sources. So we had this way to sort of have this nice DSL to say, I'm gonna clean the field name with something that sanitizes name. Um, so I, I told you in my dark ages, I started out as an enterprise consultant. So I started out in statically typed languages. Um, I mostly don't miss that. But one thing I really miss is you could refer to functions without invoking them. Drives me crazy in Ruby that uh, I can't just, like I couldn't easily invoke a, me uh, a method without invoking it. Now there's some better inspection uh, mechanisms for doing that, but especially back in the time when this was driving me crazy, um, there wasn't a great way to, to do what I would call like reflection or function passing and other methods. You can wrap things in a proc, you can wrap them in a block, but it's not the same because um, everything is going to have the same contract and it's just verbose and it's repetition. So I'm changing how Ruby works in this one place, dang it. Um, the old version I commented out here, new version, you just have a bare reference to this method and we'll figure out how to invoke it later. Um, this was so gross. I'm not going to go through the code that makes this work. I'll just uh, detail it at a high level. Uh, so the block that you pass in to import from is, uh, is evaluated inside a special context that defines method missing. If you invoke method missing in that context, what it does is remember that you invoked method missing and giving back sort of a TBD, we'll figure this out later, for when you actually need to call this function when you're importing data. When you then later call that function, you, it is evaluated in the same context and scope as the original import definition. Um, this is awful. This was such a bad idea. I can't believe I did this, but I did. Um, and especially this falls down in all kinds of, of, of interesting ways. If you want to pass in, like if you want to do currying now, um, which again, like based on how that's, that's pointed out there, like I should expect to be able to do that. Well, no, that's, that's definitely going to fall down on its face hard. Um, so this required a ton of, of, of hacks to make it work. Um, it never worked smoothly um, and it, it was a bad idea. So um, yeah, don't do that. Don't do as Donnie Don't does. Um, Similar reason, uh, this is one we did at, at Braintree. I disagree with Rails on principle. Just because you're talking about a framework, not a language, the rules don't change. Um, so let's talk about active record. So we've got user.find1, and it gives back some instance of a model called Scott. Okay, fair enough, straightforward, I'm with you. Um, I call ID, what do we all expect to get? One, wrong, runtime error. Don't call ID on active record models, use PK instead. ID is wrong. Um, so there, I touch, okay, we're good. I accidentally touched the, uh, the cable gear. Um, so there, there's a, a couple of, of reasons for this. One was principle and one was pragmatic. The, the principle was um, ID is an overloaded term. PK is, is really how this thing should be thought of. It's like classical database design. We're gonna call it PK. Um, the other relates to an old quirk that has since been, been fixed, but uh, in older versions of Ruby, um, every object uh, had a method definition on it, ID. Um, you can call ID on anything in your uh, Ruby system and it would give you back the ID of that object in um, object space. Um, active record overrode that and said no, when you call ID on an active record, you're gonna get its, uh, you're gonna get its canonical database representation, you're gonna get its primary key. Um, but that led into edge cases where if you ended up with nil rather than an active record object and called ID on it, you would get four or two. Yeah, it depends on implementation, uh, but if you're on MRI, you got four. Um, and so that really bugged us. We didn't like that. So uh, we're going to make something called PK. Um, this required a phenomenal amount of hacks. This was, this was a lot of code. This is, uh, this is something we, we, still, we still have running uh, because not only did it require a, a, a phenomenal amount of hacks, but it percolated into our database. Um, you can change code, but databases are forever, basically. Once you're running something in, in production, it is what it is. Um, what's even more uh, troubling about this is not just uh, it percolating to the database, but um, anything we, we bring in that it makes that same assumption about Rails, because that's how Rails works. We monkey patch that too. Uh, so we use data fabric for, for sharding, patched. Uh, we use anything else that relies on uh, this ID doing the right thing, we patch it. So these reasons aren't good enough. I do disagree on principle. It saves me time right now because um, what is a good reason to do this? There are actually are a couple of edge cases. I'm already contradicting myself. I told you I wouldn't lie to you again, um, but the things I said don't do, I'm, I'm now saying here's the situations I think you can do them. Um, time box changes to fundamental code. I'm not gonna go through an example here, but I will talk through it. Um, so when we were upgrading uh, this same gateway application to Rails 3.2, we ran into an issue where um, because of some things we do in Rails, uh, the, the, the flash hash, um, you know, when you have like flash, uh, flash open, uh, open bracket, whatever, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, it wasn't going to play nicely for both versions of this code to run simultaneously and use the same, uh, use the same backing store. Um, so we realized like this is a problem that's gonna exist in production for about an hour. Um, we can either change absolutely every invocation we have that accesses Flash, or we can temporarily monkey patch that with what we call the BT Flash hash. Um, we did the latter, it turned out all right. <clears throat> Um, backports. If you have critical functionality that hasn't been released yet, um, you can backport it. Uh, like you need something from Ruby 1.9 um, and, it, and it, you're on Ruby 1.8.7. Um, hopefully nobody's on 1.8.7 at this point. Again, uh, I, yeah, old, old stuff, monoliths. Um, but if you're backporting this stuff, um, then okay, you can make a, a good reason for that. The reason I put an asterisk there is unless you're talking about something where uh, the cost of forking it is pretty high, um, talking about Rails, talking about Ruby, maybe a few other things, you should really consider a fork rather than actual monkey, monkey patching. Um, even when you do this, it still carries some risks. So there's a couple ways you can mitigate this risk. You test the heck out of it. You test the happy path. You test the unhappy path. You test the why in God's name would anybody do this path. You test every conceivable scenario so that when uh, some of your assumptions change, or when people do these things, you identify it up front. Uh, because these things will fail in ways I, you can neither predict nor expect. Um, you explicitly call out your hacks as hacks. Um, one pattern I really like is app slash hacks when you have to do this stuff. So that people know, like, like not just there be dragons, like there be like zombie dragons, like you don't touch. Um, and you comment it thoroughly. Self-documenting code is not enough to, to do these kinds of things. Because again, it will tell you how. It will tell you all the kind of details. We looked at, at key grep earlier. Like, I can tell you how that function works. I can tell you where it was used. The one thing I can't answer is, why somebody did this. Um, and uh, if nothing else, like find some way to create like a time bomb spec, uh, something that will blow up when your assumptions change. Um, so this is testing like, testing the original unaltered method to make sure it still has the same contract. Testing, uh, like if nothing else in that BT flash ass situation, we, we wrote a spec, it sounds like the dumbest thing in the world, but we wrote a spec that says like, if it's a week later and this code still exists, if this code still runs, uh, this, this spec will fail. Uh, because we, we told ourselves, like, the only way we're doing this is if we're going to take it out. All right. Piece of advice, the second. Um, beware of building frameworks. We've all seen this quote a million times uh, about regular expressions and how it creates new problems, blah, 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 blah. Um, I kind of feel the same way about frameworks. Um, when, when you extract frameworks, it's not to say they're the wrong solution. Um, JWZ here is not arguing against regular expressions as a thing, but it does take on an extra level of complexity, um, and it's easy to overlook that complexity. Uh, another take on this is from my spirit guru, Sandy Metz. Um, dependencies are killing you, and when we create frameworks, we introduce new dependencies, we introduce new connections in our code base, so we have to be super careful about doing this. Um, so, uh, Hampton again called out in his, his uh, morning talk yesterday, he even said like, what even is a framework? This is a super difficult thing to define. Um, I'm gonna do my best. Um, a subsystem providing generic functionality which can be customized by clients. The reason I like this is because it serves my purposes. Um, the last phrase there on the bottom, customization by clients, that's what gets you. Or at least that's what's gotten me. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about a related concept. Um, so Martin Fowler has this idea of design stamina. Um, essentially how it works is there's this hypothetical like good design line where you don't lose productivity over time because you have the right design. Um, and you have this other line which is like no design of like it's easy to get started with this but over time um, you're gonna run into a lot of problems because you really haven't thought through what the structure of your application should be. Um, I think when we talk about building frameworks, we're talking about sort of moving that blue line or wherever our application currently falls in this closer to that good design. Um, we're talking about a long-term investment to make future development easier. Um, we've got to be very cognizant of how and when we're paying those costs, though. So, concrete example. Um, this is the only thing I've, I've actually, I've made up. Um, this is closed source from a previous encounter. I can't really, uh, I can't show you the original source, but um, this is talking about controllers, uh, and this is a painful story we learned at Groupon. Um, so here's a movie controller. Um, this is a, a bog standard Rails, uh, Rails 3 controller. Um, not very interesting. So. Um, as an application grows, you're probably writing this controller or a variation on it a zillion times. So we're naturally, we're able to say like, hey, that's repetition. We don't repeat ourselves. We're good software developers. Um, so we're gonna build a framework called Deep Rest. Um, and Deep Rest, now we just say what resource we're working with, and also we have this special edge case where um, on new actions, we need, a, we need an additional instance variable set so the views can, can have it and everything will be great. 
So far, so good. Um, V2 rolls around and we say, you know what, um, really not all users should be able to uh, create and modify these movies. Let's say we're building like IMDB or something. Uh, really we only want admin users to be able to do that. So we're going to say now index and show don't require login. Um, everything else that's going to be assumed requires a login. Okay, great. Um, well now we've got a problem, um, we've got a Robin Hood problem. There's five million movies that have been called Robin Hood, and our support users keep adding them. It's, it's really hard to untangle, so we've got an issue with duplicates. We want to check and optionally, um, optionally like, take a, an unexpected action based on one of these values. Okay. Well, we've got this before filter, and the before filter operates on an action we haven't actually defined, which is a little weird, um, and it calls this check for duplicate. Check for duplicate renders a, a new template, and again, it's not really clear like, how, how new plays into any of this at all, because it's, it's no longer explicit in this controller. It's all, it's all very implicit. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, you know, oh darn it, we, we now, we don't just have admin users. We, we trust most of our, our usual uh, internal users to create new movies or make edits, but the one thing we don't want to let them do is delete. We don't delete, you know, URLs are forever, blah, 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 blah. Um, so we're going to introduce roles to this now. Um, so we've got this access method. Um, we say we have a special non-role key called public, uh, the, the, the role which defines a lack of role, and we say which actions are available for those. We have support and admin that can access this other set, and then we have an admin that can only do delete. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty painful place to be in now um, for, for a number of reasons. In, in particular, the most pernicious here is uh, we've really complicated the normal happy path. Like, most controllers we have are still going to be following that original really simple example we started from. Um, but now, like, if you want to use deep rest, like, You've got to think about access. You've got to think about all these other things, and this is this is not this is not very straightforward. This is not good. Um, so a couple of mistakes were made here. First, we created a framework for a pretty simple problem. Um, again, like making deciding to make a framework is a, a discussion about trading off complexity, uh, where we can accept it, where we can't. Um, and so in this case, we looked at a really simple problem of we're tired of writing these these very similar controllers over and over. Let's fix that. Um, we made it pretty early on um, before we really understood like what, it, what are the problems our controllers are going to have to solve. We didn't understand the problem domain very well, um, but we jumped right into creating a, a framework. Um, and as we went along, we just sort of packed on stuff. We just solved the problem at hand. Um, we weren't really careful about refactoring. Um, and it's very easy to talk about, like, we've got to refactor constantly, la, 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 la. Um, and that's true. We do. Um, but if you're creating a framework, that's super true because by definition, you're working on code that impacts um, all kinds of downstream clients. So your, your refactoring, your design choices constantly matter. Um, so here's a different way to deal with that same kind of complexity. Let people just opt out of it. Either say you're in or you're out, but there's, there's no middle ground. Um, this is not code we wrote, but this is code that you can't find open source. This is a RESTful controller. Um, this is not something I've used, but I really admire the design of it. Um, you can say, again, here's, here's the solution of the, that first phase in wrestle controller world. You have a movie controller. If you want to do something in a special in an action, you don't use it. You just override the method and you do whatever you would normally do. Mm, this is perfect. Um, because now, like, you've solved, you've solved the simple problem. And if, you, if the simple problem is the 80% case, most controllers, you can just say, here's the class, here's our invocation of wrestle controller, we're done. Great. Um, but you let those people opt out of it in a way that makes sense without being too obtrusive. Okay, here's another thing I did. Um, so I talked about that importer. Uh, this thing was the bane of my existence. I made so many mistakes. I learned a ton, um, but this is, this is the initial V1 version of that interface. Um, so the, the point I'm, I'm largely trying to make here is not so specifically about this, but it's really like, as Rubyists, like, what are you talking about? My method doesn't take 45 optional uh, arguments. It takes one options hash. There we go, <laughs> boom. Um, <laughs> no, it's not really that great. Um, so here's the problem. So we define an import. We have a delimiter. Uh, you can see CSV or TSV. Uh, really, it's a format. It's not even a delimiter. That's kind of a misnomer, but it is what it is. Um, we have a location, um, or you can pass in a stream. You've got to have one and only one of those two. You can't pass in both. You can't pass in neither. Um, fields. So we've got to call these things something. Uh, you can pass in an array of what you want them to be called. Uh, you can say you can pass in a symbol, which tells us to infer it um, and to load it from the first row of the CSV. Or you can actually pass in a pass on, uh, path on disk to uh, an external mapping um, that, that says these fields map in the following different way. Uh, and we finally have validations, um, basically things that say we will or will not import this row. 
Um, if you have defined field headers through whatever mechanism you choose, then you should pass in a hash that is a collection of keys, that is field names to uh, collections of pro procs. If you don't, um, then you want to just pass in a bare array. You don't want to pass in that hash. So this is a really problematic interface. Uh, let's talk about why. Um, okay, so again, we have this diagram here of um, uh, you know, some, some interface A and a bunch of classes that are clients of that interface. So let's say we add in a new, a new client of this smile emoticon. Um, and smile emoticon has a couple of new requirements of the original base case that we need to consider. Well, okay, we just go and change that. That's not a big deal. Except um, when you change the original interface, you've got to think about everything that also um, is using and relying upon that same interface. So by adding smile emoticon, ah, oh, crap. Well, now this complexity has crept into the entire system here. Um, this, is, this is a problem. This, is, this now makes this really, really difficult to change. Again, um, most of the changes are probably going to happen when I've lost all original context anyway. I don't know what implements this. Hopefully it's at least an explicit interface like this. Hopefully it's not a crazy Ruby hack that I, I did earlier in my career. Um, so really, smile emoticon is frown emoticon, because this is tough. This is unnecessarily tough. Um, let's talk about our solid principles, because they can help us out here. We've got single responsibility, open closed, Liskov substitution, uh, the one Rubyists don't talk about. Dependency something or other. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, open, open closed, like, that, that could help us here. The, 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 the TLDR of open closed principle is, a, you know, when you write code, it should be open for extension but closed for modification. Um, that's really hard. Um, that's, that's, like, the easiest thing to say, and it's, it's a challenge. Like, I'm lucky if that happens like a couple times a year where I think like, yeah, I got this right. Okay, cool. Um, but there's another one of the principles here that we kind of, uh, we overlook um, that we, we don't talk about as often as we should. Um, interface segregation principle. Um, and this is one, like a lot of notable people in the community, again, my, my spirit guru, uh, Metz, will even say like, yeah, you don't need to worry about this as a Rubyist. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say I, I don't think that's totally accurate. Um, so let's define what it is, because I don't think anybody usually understands it. Uh, this is a quote from me paraphrasing um, the white paper by Uncle Bob. Uh, no client should depend on an interface it does not use most of. Now, the original reason we all decided, like, oh, this doesn't apply to us, la, 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 um, is in the original white paper, Uncle Bob talks a lot about recompilation um, as, as, like, the, the root of all evils. Um, he's specifically talking about it in a time when, like, he was writing C++. Um, and I agree, recompilation sucks, but as Rubyists, like, we don't do a lot of that, so um, that led a lot of people to say, like, well, we don't really need to think about this. Um, but it's, it's really gnarly, because it does, he also talks about the, the maintenance headache, um, and, and we'll, we'll talk about, it, it, we'll, we'll go into exactly how that manifests itself. Um, so again, to recap, this is our interface. Um, by definition of this interface, clients are not using most of it. Like, I have designed this in a way you can't use most of it because it's mostly uh, mutually exclusive in particular ways. Ouch. Um, and again, this is our, our logical problem here where we introduce smile emoticon, it changes that interface, it creates all kind of complexity. So what interface segregation principle tells us to do is rather than have everybody talk to that original rep representation of what is this problem, you create adapters. That's really it. It's, it unlike open closed, this is one that's pretty straightforward to apply. Um, and so then, you know, if I need to introduce a new behavior um, that, uh, of smile emoticon here, it talks to adapter one, and yeah, I need to think about the other use cases for adapter one, but if I'm doing my job well, that's where the, the complexity begins and ends. <clears throat> Even if I get unlucky and this thing exerts backwards force, uh, this wonderful phrase, again, Uncle Bob talks a lot about in, the, about in, this, in this white paper, the backwards force uh, exerted by clients upon their, their, uh, their interfaces. Um, even if it percolates back up, I've still really reduced the scope at which I have to operate. Um, again, you know, for the sake of argument, imagine that there's not five, there's 50 or uh, 500, which if we're building a, a framework and doing it for the right reasons, there will be. Um, so what's an example where this goes well? Uh, active record. I think active record does this pretty well. Um, so here I've got this fictional order class here and it belongs to customer. Now, as a consumer of this, you don't need to know that underneath the hood, these are all just reflections. And when you say belongs to blah, 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 uh, Active Record is saying, okay, well, I know how to translate that to a reflection. I'm going to add this to the cl current collection of all known reflections, and blah, et cetera. Um, you don't have to worry about it. You just have to worry about defining the things that matter specifically to belongs to. 
Uh, and so you can go and look at these. And if you're really courageous, go and look at uh, has and belongs to many um, and, and see like, oh, wow, I'm really thankful they have this pattern because that's gross. Um, and, and you can see this. So this is a great example. One last uh, tale of woe, um, the sad tale of prairie farm. Um, prairie farm is something we built at, at Braintree. Um, we, we don't recommend it. Um, so it, again, like most of these things, it starts out with good intentions and somebody having like a, a, a clever insight. We've got these forms. We've got this form for user. It's got an email and a password. Uh, this is a very con like this is a very hypothetical. The, the forms here, are th these are not real, because um, yeah, uh, especially when you see the other side of this. But um, we've also got this model user, and hey, it has this idea of a model, uh, an email, and it has this idea of a password. And these kind of things are kind of similarly related, right? There's some conceptual overlap. Shouldn't they be the same thing? No. Uh, no is the short answer. I'm going to fast forward to the end of this story because I don't want to take forever uh, just retelling tales of woe. Um, so we tried several different implementations trying to get this to work. Uh, this is our under review form. I'm not going to exactly go into to what it does. Um, but some things to point out here. Uh, we've got this concept of a theme. Um, that's mixed in with uh, all of these name fields and text fields because we realize like, oh, well, some of the forms display a certain different way and that's, that's got to be inherent to it. Um, we've got, rather than have any explicit relationship to a model, uh, we've got a populate model method that knows how to turn this form into a model, but actually there's some weird edge cases we need to, to account for because it doesn't apply cleanly. Uh, I'm not even going to go into the gnarliness in these includes, where we actually have like other fields and other validations that we optionally pull into this, uh, because this, this thing was really tough and challenging. Um, so the moral of this story, not all repetition is created equal. I kind of think of it in three different categories. Um, the, the most innocuous, the kind I care the least about, is test repetition. I'm not even talking about test repetition. We made mistakes there too. but. Um, like test repetition is not production code. I don't particularly care about the maintenance cost of an, my test suite. Um, so I love straightforward repetitive code in my test suite. I give me more, please, because um, it makes it makes the other changes, the things I got to do in production code, really easy. Um, there's incidental repetition. This is sort of the the first class of concerns that we talked about with the movie controller, um, where it's just. It happens that these two things are very structurally similar, but they're not similar because they actually share conceptual overlap. Um, if you're coming across incidental repetition and you want to solve it with a framework, I highly recommend the approach of build the happy path and tell people to get on or, or leave it be, but don't, uh, but don't make it try to work for everything. And the last most difficult kind is actual conceptual repeti repetition. Um, repetition where these two things actually represent all or part of the same idea. Uh, again, in that, that example of prairie form, um, like, yes, there is conceptual overlap. If I had a Venn diagram, it'd be like, it'd look like a normal Venn diagram. Um, and that, that, is, that is an area where frameworks can solve major categories of problems. But it's also really challenging, because that's also the heart of complexity. If we go back to that idea of design stamina, um, that's our biggest opportunity to both like, trend that line upwards, back towards good design. It's also our biggest opportunity to trend it downwards and say, like, ooh, this is, this is worse than nothing. Um, so, to recap, frameworks. There's all kinds of failure modes for trying to build frameworks. Um, what's really problematic and challenging about trying to do this is most of the frameworks uh, are orthogonal to the problem domain. You know, again, like I'm talking about IMDB and, and the framework I'm building is about controller overlap. Um, talking about, uh, you know, like in the case of Braintree, like our, our online sign-up form, and I'm really talking about like the representation of like validations and, and attributes. So these things like they're not solving business problems; they're solving technical problems. And so we have to be very cognizant of how much time we're spending on those because um, it's very like there are investments made to be future looking. They're def like by definition they're not solving today's problems. So proceed with caution if that's not clear already. <laughs> Um, you can do this well. Um, so uh, an example I'm not going to, again, I'll just sort of talk through. Um, one thing I think we've done at Braintree that I think has turned out well, a framework we've built and we use internally, um, is, is uh, for, for serializing API error codes. Um, you know, we, our product is an API that we give to customers. Um, we, as we've, we've been splitting up that monolith into smaller and smaller chunks, more and more services can impact what error codes we send to our clients. Um, so we built, we built a shared uh, framework that we used between projects um, to make sure like all services can do this in a standard way. Like I as that monolith can say like, oh, okay, well this, this other service I depend upon to generate an error, I know how to pass that through in a way that makes sense to my clients. 
Um, this was successful, one, um, because, uh, because we really, really understood this problem. We waited until we felt it and uh, we, we waited until we like, really understood like, what does it need to look like for our clients? What's the ultimate cause of this? Um, and also, I think it was successful because it didn't just span in a single application. Like, we knew at the time like, this has got to work already in three or four different services. So we understand the, the, the clients of this pretty well. So if you're, if you're coming into those kind of concerns, absolutely consider it. Um, I'm not trying to say don't do this, but um, if you're just working in, you know, again, if you're just working in a pure monolith um, and, and, you know, the idea is like, well, it'd be cool to open source this, or, well, uh, you know, this is an interesting approach to this, I'd really like to try it, like, uh, be, be cautious. Um, okay, deliberately cultivate patterns. Uh, so as a recap, uh, we, we sort of have exponential code growth. Um, some facts about organizations that experience this from my experience. Um, Headcount increases in a similar trend. Obviously not the same numbers, we don't have hundreds of thousands of developers, not at all, but um, it's the same kind of curve. Um, no matter how diligent you are, this is too fast for organic knowledge spreading. Um, so, you know, like Braintree is, like we are the most hardcore of any place I've ever worked about pairing. We pair all the time. No code goes to production without us pairing. Even then, we're not good enough to, to spread knowledge organically. So, new team members will use existing code as the definition of best practices, period. Implications for us. The patterns we choose have a long tail. They echo throughout time. Even if the choice is no patterns, okay, people will see there's no patterns here. Cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build everything straight into the model. Great, got it, I'll go. Um, this is a problem. So what to do? We choose patterns deliberately. We choose them up front. Uh, we, we, they are first class concerns in designing an application. We try to make it as obvious as possible what the, uh, the patterns we've chosen are. Um, and we make those patterns the easiest option available. So when I say choose patterns deliberately, it's very easy to think of patterns just in terms of uh, design patterns. Um, those are great, those are awesome, but those are honestly a little bit lower level than what I'm talking about here. The patterns I'm really talking about are much more in this, this flavor. Um, if you've not read Patterns of Enterprise or Application Architecture, I highly recommend it. It's, it's greatest of all time, um, it's really good. Uh, you read it and you get two things out of it. One, you'll understand Rails much better. Um, Rails, like, Rails is a great framework. Um, a lot of the insights um, ultimately derive from patterns that Martin Fowler and others had, had laid out years before. The other thing is uh, there's some patterns Rails doesn't go into, particularly services and use cases, uh, and sometimes queries, depending on the kind of application you're working on. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go into those, but I think they can be super useful for, for applications um, to sort of encapsulate business processes and things and, and start moving some of those things out of models. Um, be obvious and make it easy. Um, it's very easy to, to come into Rails and say like, well, the only things you should have under app are controllers, models, templates, views, because that's, that's what you get. Um, no, when you, have, when, you have a big important, um, when you have a big important pattern to your code base, bake it in. Make it hard to miss, because again, people are gonna be looking through the code, looking for guidance, you wanna give it to them. So we've got the, the standard flavors of things you get from Rails, but we've also got some things, uh, some patterns like services we've adapted from uh, patterns of enterprise our, our, uh, application architecture. We've also got some things that are uh, application specific, uh, things like jobs and sweepers. I'm not really gonna talk about that, but um, those have particular meaning for our context. Those are sort of uh, domain specific patterns we came up with, but we wanted to make it um, obvious. And also we build all of these other services to assume the people who are consuming or uh, feeding things into this are using those same patterns. We're not gonna worry about people who aren't on the happy path. If you're not on the happy path, you've already accepted some, some pain and anguish. We're gonna make this the absolute easiest approach to follow. All right, the last part of this is commit-based documentation. Um, so we've got code as a form of documentation. We've got self-documented code, that's great. We've got comments, eh, we don't like comments, we wanna have as few as possible, but a necessary evil. Um, we've got external documentation we can write, that's super useful, um, but there's something missing, whoops. There's something missing from that picture. Um, so to recap, we talked about this monolith earlier. Um, one of the, the key things about this um, is we understand how, we understand what. What we don't understand is why. We can't answer why somebody did this. It's a mystery to us. Maybe it has some kind of cultural or religious significance. Maybe it was somebody trying to impress a significant other, saying, hey, look at this cool piece of rock. I don't know. Um, so here's how we plug in that missing gap for code. Here's a commit that's actually from our code base. This is uh, my colleague Tony uh, correcting a typo he put into production, and he's tying it back to one of our stories. This is one of our stories in Trello. Um, here's a similar example of somebody doing that from years ago, and we had a different work tracker. We had Mingle. Nobody liked Mingle. Uh, in this case, it was story 33, uh, 38. Um, the important thing here is that these stories are part of your documentation. This commit message is part of your documentation. Use it. Um, 
So that's, that's the missing part of this. We have a commit message and that explains at a high level what this is about, and we have a work tracker. And uh, the implication of this is our work trackers, our stories, they're part of our documentation. They're part of our code base. They, they don't get deleted. They don't get archived. They don't get moved to a place where we can't look at them. We've switched work tracking systems a couple times, but guess what? We run them all because we need, to, we need that information on hand to understand why did Ali and Chu do this back in the summer of 2012. I have no idea why. That also has an implication of we've got to uh, make sure those stories, like it doesn't matter how close I am with the people I'm working with, uh, we've got to make sure those stories have a complete um, set of context. I can't just say fix cron without explaining what needs to be fixed about it and why. When possible, do it in one atomic commit because um, it makes it much easier to sort through this when you're, again, you're trying to find it two years later. So to recap, don't write hacks, beware of building frameworks, deliberately cultivate patterns, and use commit-based documentation. I work for a company called Braintree. We do online payment processing. Uh, if you're a merchant, I'd love to talk to you. If you, like, uh, if you like remote work or you want to come work for us in Chicago, San Francisco, New York, I'd love to talk to you. I would take questions, but I'm out of time, so thank you very much.